taken place in powers Illinois uh, people of all faiths to be leaders in caring for the earth, providing resources to educate, connect, and advocate for healthier communities. We believe that people of faith lead the environmental movement. It is a movement focused on justice and care for our common environment. So we are staff of 17. We are located in Chicago, Lake County, North and Northwest suburbs, Urbana, um, Champaign, and Southern Illinois. So again, my name is Isioma Odom, and I'm the Energy and Climate Change Coordinator for Faith in Place. I started my journey at Faith in Place in May of 2018. Prior to working for Faith in Place, I was a hospital labor organizer for the Services Employee International Union. I relocated to Chicago from Sacramento, California after deciding that I wanted to pursue a higher education. I graduated May 2017 from Loyola University with my master's in social justice. My passion for environmental justice stems from my interest in racial justice, which is embedded in my core values. I believe that in order to have a society of social change, there must be a focus on dismantling systemic structures. In today's conversation, we'll focus on racial justice and its intersection with COVID-19 pandemic and the climate crisis. We will also look at faith in place programs and how we champion environmental justice through our green team model. And later on, we will hear from our faith partner, Pastor Roshona Fitzpatrick from Stone Temple Baptist Church. And lastly, we will talk about the ways to get involved. Throughout the presentation, we will post a poll and I encourage your participation. COVID-19 death rates in the U.S. are 8% higher in cities with higher than average death rates, such as LA. And despite being 30% of the population in Chicago, Blacks make up 43% of the COVID-19 related deaths. This complex reason is many, has many reasons. Um, misinformation, the lack, of, um, the lack of access to healthcare, and the racism that is associated with that access also exists and also the inability to socially distance due to jobs and housing and multi-generational homes. Environmental risks include air quality and lack of access to healthy foods. There are just some of the reasons outlined in this presenta presentation today. So why are people of color more susceptible to COVID-19? The reality is that COVID-19 could push 71 million people into extreme poverty in 2020 under the baseline scenario and 100 million under the downside scenario. So a large share of this new extreme poor will be concentrated in countries that are already struggling with high poverty rates and high numbers of poor. So this is our first poll, if you can please participate. What are some ways that climate change affects life in Chicago? It's looking like all the above. So let's get into a little bit about how climate change and race in Chicago is impacted. The melting glaciers in Greenland is not the only climate crisis issue that needs urgent attention. There are many concerns that are impacting millions of people all over the world, as you will soon see, and mostly impacting vulnerable populations. Communities of color are more vulnerable to heat waves, lead poisoning, flooding and mold, making homes dangerous to live in, and poor air quality. And these toxic and dangerous conditions cause health disparities and other barriers that prevent many communities from flourishing. The death of George Floyd and the civil unrest has brought to light the many issues associated with racism in America. One important concern to highlight is mental health, as studies will show the link between racism and symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder. Racial migration, my, microaggressions make it difficult to mentally manage the sheer volume of racial stressors. Let's take a look at the environmental impacts of climate crisis in Chicago from last year. This is a photo of a frozen walkway along Lake Michigan in Chicago during the polar vortex. The polar vortex is an area of very cold air and low air pressure that always surrounds both of the Earth's poles. 
The polar vortex is also characterized by very strong winds, tens of thousands of feet up in the atmosphere that act to hold the cold air at the poles. Sometimes the vortex becomes unstable and fractures, and this can lead to very cold air spilling from the poles and into the regions of the globe. Warming temperatures and melting ice in the Arctic may be one cause of the polar vortex becoming unstable and a waver jet stream pattern that results in cold air masses traveling from poles to lower latitudes. Again, inequitable impacts of climate change causes sea level rises, national disasters in storms like hurricanes, flooding, heat waves, vector borne diseases, fewer resources, less support, and as previously mentioned, poor air quality. In terms of COVID-19, there was a big study out of Harvard several months ago showing that the areas of the US that have more air pollution from burning fossil fuels have an 8% higher death rate from COVID-19 county by county. And according to the World Health Organization, air pollution kills 9 million people a year. So as the, you can see from the graph that will be shown that the pollution from extracting the burning fossil fuels isn't only driving the climate crisis, it's also creating a public and environmental health crisis worldwide. And while pollution is a threat to common resources, some people are disproportionately impacted. Fossil fuel pollution is changing our climate and climate change is making the public health impacts of COVID-19 worse. So while there's no evidence of climate change directly contributing to the emergence of COVID-19, Climate change can indirectly affect the larger COVID-19 response due to its impact on public health and stress on health systems. People living with poor air quality, especially those in most vulnerable communities, like people experiencing homelessness, people with homes lacking air filtration, are people with compromised health conditions. They are more likely to die from COVID-19. And due to the longstanding racist housing policies and practices and other systemic inequalities, Communities of color in the U.S. are more likely to live with higher rates of pollution and be at higher risk of getting COVID-19 or contracting severe illnesses. Not to mention that COVID-19 may affect planning and prepping for hurricanes and other national disasters, as well as recovering efforts due to the strained medical and personal hygiene resources and the difficulty in maintaining physical distancing and public shelters. And we'll pop up the slides when we can. So the flooding in the U.S. is disproportionately impacts Black neighborhoods. And as the world gets warmer, the extra heat is intensifying the water cycle and leading to more extreme floods in many places around the world. Floods are caused by amplified by both weather and human-related factors. Major uh, weather factors include heavy and a prolonged precipitation, snow melt, thunderstorms, storm surges from hurricanes, and collapsed ice or debris jams in waterways. Human factors include structural failures of dams and levees, altered drainage, and land cover alterations. Heavy downpours are instances when the amount of rain or snow exceeds what is normal, which varies by location and season. And these events are on the rise with climate change. And this photo is of two women carrying small children in New Orleans, Louisiana. And this is another example of how the climate crisis impacts certain populations. If you look at the 10 counties in the United States that are most vulnerable to climate-related disasters, they're 81% minority in their population. We know that communities of color and low-income neighborhoods are disproportionately at risk for the climate crisis, notably minority communities and are more vulnerable to disasters in extreme heat, just as was the, the Chicago heat wave that happened. So that's one example. We also know that communities of color and low um, excuse me, counties and cities and neighborhoods with large numbers of Black and Hispanic residents are more likely than others to suffer from events such as flooding and extreme heat because they are often located in damaged porn areas and frequently lack the resources and investment to recover quickly from disaster. And in the U.S., this is part of a result of decades of long policies that clustered minorities in undesirable areas such as floodplains and denied amenities like green spaces and tree canopies. And just two months ago in Michigan, two dams were busted open by downpours and rain bombs. And this is one of them, Stanford Dam. And downstream, of course, the communities were flooded and some of the dams and other infrastructure projects that were built for a different time and a different climate condition could not stand up to these new conditions. 
So this video depicts how an aging infrastructure of a failed spillaway were not built to withstand today's climate conditions. If you look back at Hurricane Harvey in Port Arthur, Texas, there were 100 toxic chemical releases during the downpour and the flooding that accompanied Hurricane Harvey. This was been devastating for the people in that area. And this photo is showing uh, old holding tanks and flood water, flooded water. And during Hurricane Harvey, this resulted in more than 100 toxic chemical releases, and many of which um, occurred in low income and minority communities. So climate change can influence hurricanes in several ways. Since 1995, more than 90% of the excess heat retained by Earth has been absorbed by the oceans. And warmer ocean temperatures, which are likely fueled by tropical storms, can result in more intense storms or higher wind speeds. And furthermore, warmer oceans and warmer air above the oceans result in more water evaporating from, ocean surface, from the ocean surface into the atmosphere. And for every one degree Fahrenheit that the atmosphere warms, it can hold about 4% more water vapor. In turn, extra water vapor can lead to heavier downpours and subsequent flooding. Warmer water also takes up more space. This along with melting land ice has caused global sea levels to rise, yielding storm surges that are higher and can move further inland than otherwise would. Flood damages to this replica of Noah's Ark in Kentucky caused a $1 million lawsuit. Extreme floods used to be rare events, but in recent years, they have become more and more frequent, intense, and very costly. Here is just a few weeks ago in Arizona, where hundreds of square miles already burned this year. Researchers show that changes in climate have led to hot, dry conditions that increase the risk of fire activity. Wildfires are increasing in size, intensity, and duration, burning hotter and longer, and fire seasons are also lasting longer. If you look at the indigenous populations in New Mexico, where the Navajo Nation has so many members, the death rate from COVID-19 is seven times higher than the death rate for other groups. And nearby Arizona is more than five times higher. And again, this reflects many factors. Communities of color and minority populations are far more likely to be downwind from the smokestacks and downstream from the hazardous waste flows or live adjacent to the coal ash sites and the hazardous chemical waste sites. And they're more likely to have less access to quality healthcare. Now, let's take a glimpse at the impacts of climate change internationally. This was just one month ago in Alberta, Canada, one of the most expensive natural disasters in Canada. This was a hailstorm. This was just a couple weeks ago in Wuhan, China. Days of downpours caused major flooding in the region. A few weeks ago, the Democratic Republic of Congo, where more than 70,000 people lost their homes. This was in Sudan, less than a year ago. Tens of thousands displaced and many lost their lives. And it goes on. In Brazil, at the beginning of this year, 30 people killed in this flooding and landslides. 80,000 displaced in Mali last year. In Mexico, there was five feet of hell in 15 minutes. These people had to be rescued with chainsaws. Here's another five feet of hell in Mexico just one year ago. There's a strong indication that climate change has exuberated conflict and the stresses of climate change on national resources had led to conflicts especially in areas where communities rely heavily on communal resources such as water and pasture for the livestock and crops. Many coastal cities in Horn of Africa have, some rapid have seen rapid urbanization. Sea level rises in these cities could displace many people and potentially incite more conflict. The region has been 
experiencing severe droughts that have accelerated regional conflict as seen in Somalia and Sudan, forcing more people to migrate to nearby countries. Those who have no means to migrate and end up getting trapped, possibly dying from severe starvation and growing conflict. And by 2050, the climate crisis has the potential to push more than 140 million people, or almost 3% of the global population from just three regions of the world, to move from their homes, contributing to an already growing migration crisis. And according to the Lancet Countdown Report, the world as a whole can see up to 1 billion climate migrants by the end of the century. The economic costs of these catastrophes are also an issue that needs to be considered. If you look at all these disasters, this is from the Munich report, you can see that the rising costs are really threatening to overwhelm the insurance industry. In 2019, about 820 national disasters were registered around the world with overall losses totaling $150 billion, with 52 billion, just over one third insured. In 2018, about 850 national catastrophes were reported around the world with the overall losses totaling 160 billion, and which roughly is 80 billion was insured. In the last decade, we lost two and a half trillion dollars for climate related extreme weather disasters. And this is an increase of over the previous decade of almost one trillion. And again, their projections are that this is going to continue to get worse. The climate crisis is also a national security crisis, not just for the U.S., as the Department of Defense pointed out uh, quite a few years ago, but for countries all over the world. In 2014, the Pentagon here in the United States singled out the risk of food shortages, water shortages, pandemic disease, and also refugees. That leads us to climate change and the demands of water. If you look at the demand for water when the temperature goes up because of the climate crisis, that increases the use of water by people, agriculture, crops, and animals, and by the energy and production industry. And what we have seen is that water scarcity is already a problem for more than 40% of the world's population. And those of us who are privileged to live in areas where this has not been a problem sometimes are surprised to realize how serious a crisis is in many parts of the, of the world. So let's put this into perspective. Lack of running water now for washing hands is obviously an incredibly serious issue during the COVID-19 pandemic and not just for COVID-19, but other disease and illness, illnesses. So inequalities in water access have really increased the global vulnerability to COVID-19. According to the World Health Organization, 3 billion people globally still lack basic hand washing facilities at home as of 2017, making the frequent hand washing frequent required to prevent the contraction of the virus difficult or impossible. For example, about 60 million people in Nigeria must leave their homes and come together at community pumps to have access to clean water, risking exposure to the virus. These disparities in water access have in, indeed led to heightened cases of COVID-19. For instance, the Navajo Nation have the third highest rate of COVID-19 infections, partly due to lack of water infrastructures. In addition to curbing the impacts of COVID-19, improved access to water sanitation and hygiene can prevent nearly one-tenth of global diseases. And again, we are now in the middle of this pandemic. And it's worth remembering that COVID-19 has already pushed a lot more people into hunger status. And some of the scientists are deeply concerned about this. The loss of the income from the COVID-19 driven recession will push millions of people into food insecurity. The pandemic has already affected the labor supply and export markets for some food crops and commodities. COVID-19 has resulted in higher rates of unemployment globally, 
which combined with the other factors could lead to food insecurity. How Faith in Place is Creating Healthier Communities. So at Faith in Place, we have five programs, um, energy and climate change, water preservation, advocacy, sustainable food and land use, and youth. So as a person of faith, we understand that we have a moral obligation to care for the air that we share and work together to reverse the disproportionate impacts of climate change. So you all are a part of the solution to reduce air pollution, decrease the effects of climate change, and lower energy bills. Energy con conservation, which reduces our need to generate energy from power plants, is the easiest and most effective way to reduce our carbon footprint and decrease the population that, ex that um, causes asthma. So Faith in Place works to make sure that people of faith like you understand how to reduce their energy use through our programs. Through our water preservation program, people living in Illinois and particularly Cook County and Chicago are all too familiar with the problem of basement flooding and sewer backups as a result of the sewer system being overwhelmed with wastewater runoff during storms and spring snow melt. Faith in Place works with people of faith to build solutions to the most pressing water needs in their area. We implement our water programs to communities of faith who can live, who can live out their moral obligation to maintain a clean and abundant water supply for our neighbors downstream and prevent the disproportionate burden of flooding. So under this program, we have our interfaith water curriculum, rain barrels, rain gardens, water audits, and retrofits. And in our advocacy program, we don't just talk the talk, but we also walk the walk and take our efforts to Springfield every year to advocate for things like clean energy jobs. We also host faithful citizen workshops where we talk to congregations about lobbying and to learn more about ways to get involved. Under our sustainable food and land use, we have our congregation supported agriculture program, our just eating curriculum program that will soon be going again, our migration and need program, and our winter farmers market. We promote sustainable farming methods and economic justice for all people, regardless of income or ge ge geographic. So we encourage healthy, wholesome eating, support the building of relationships between producers and consumers through our um, three con um, congregational supported agriculture farms. We have two in central Illinois and one here in Chicago. We also have our youth program. Uh, where right now is actually taking place right now. It's a summer program where we actually pay youth to learn more about environmental justice. How we address racism and climate change. So, here at Faith in Place, we support programs and policies that build climate justice. We bridge the gap between dismantling racism and address climate change by focusing our advocacy and programs on people first and ensuring communities normally overlooked are lifted up. So here are some examples. Educating people about smart energy. So you can learn about smart energy each month during our climate solutions webinar. We have linked all of our registration links in the chat. In these presentations, we will dive deeper into how smart energy is one key factor in addressing the climate crisis, as well as give you tips and tricks to save money on your energy bills. Another example is our Solar for All program. You will also learn more about solar and ways to become trained as a solar and solid. Solar for Our program is an example of climate justice. We empower people to advocate for policies that make programs like this possible. And another example is our Lobby Day. Uh, we bring people of faith from across Illinois to speak with our legislators about policies that advocate for climate justice in Springfield. So we bring hundreds of people every year to Springfield, um, which is an awesome event uh, for anyone. It's completely free and we provide all of the transportation. Of course, we cannot accomplish what we do alone. 
Our green team model is takes a committed group of faithful people to implement our programs and keep the members connected to their environmental goal and objectives. So we cannot connect these people, our, those people to the resources uh, without our community partners. Now I would like to introduce Pastor Roshana from Stone Temple Baptist Church. Pastor Roshana, can you tell us how you got connected with Faith in Place? What has been your experience working with your green team at Stone Temple? And share with us some of the work Stone Temple is doing to champion for environmental justice. Also, well, share with us, um, oh sorry, also can you share also who is leading um, your, your green team? and how that happens. Yes, so good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for um, allowing me to come and to share my experience with Faith in Place and the Green Team. So first of all, a couple of years ago, I was approached by Veronica and Samantha to start a garden um, at Stone Temple Church. And of course, having no garden experience, I'm thinking, you know, I don't know if I'm going to be able to do this, but I'm willing to take the shot at it because they brought the right partners to the table and we had planning meetings. We got the community involved. And before you knew it, there was this beautiful garden that we sat down and planned and it came into fruition. So that was my first experience and it was an awesome experience. Not only did they bring the right partners to the table, um, but they also gave us some funds to make sure this thing would really work out. And I was able to also talk to some local um, businesses to get some of the items we needed, some of the materials that we needed. And it was just a, a wonderful experience. They brought to the table some really wonderful gardeners. Um, um, Anna Maria Leon, who is a perfect gardener, a, a horticulturalist, she's a permaculturist. She knows so much about gardening that it just, there's no way you cannot succeed without her. And then Elvia Rodriguez um, was also on our team. And then I had a host uh, and still have that group from Chicago sign a beautiful people. As a matter of fact, I see Susan Stone. She's on um, the Zoom with us. Um, just a group of beautiful people that I now call my family. We put together that garden in 2018. And um, there you see our family day where we invited families from the community and from Chicago sign a, from um, all of our partners. And the children had a phenomenal time. Even this year when we thought that we were not going to be able to get back into the garden and, and work because of COVID, well, COVID didn't stop us because we created some new beds with the help of our partners from Chicago Sinai, installed them, and we are up and running. Um, the neighbors uh, have taken ownership. They come out, they water every Tuesday. My Chicago Sinai family, we come out. As a matter of fact, they're out there now while I'm in here with you all. <laughs> so this has been just joyous and um, we realized that with this pandemic there is a shortage of food um, in this community in the North Londale community where we are located and it's just not new um, there is a lot of unhealthy food being sold in this neighborhood so our food from our garden is given to the community and with that it makes them have more of an appetite for fresh who I like, I like to say from the farm to the table, and it tastes so much better. We're in the process of teaching young people in this community and their families how to um, help the environment by growing food in their backyard, um, using soil that will make sure that the food is safe and, and, and good for you and, and yummy because this food from this garden is absolutely delicious. Um, I've been cooking some of the collard greens and some of the chard and I can imagine how the neighbors feel when they get it and they're eating it. So that's something we're doing in our community to try to help um, the food pandemic um, that we are experiencing to make it better for the community dwellers to eat healthy and to maintain um, their health because as I was listening and as I've been hearing about the pandemic, um, one of the reasons, another reason why uh, the Black community is so affected is because of pre-existing health conditions, which stems from a lack of food or poor food or unhealthy food. So we, we know that there's a problem. So instead of just talking about it, 
we want to be a part of the change. And so that's what we're doing. Thanks to um, Faith in Place and their partnership. And hey, if you're interested in being a part of it, um, just contact Faith in Place because they are, they will get you some great partners and the partners are, you know, it, it becomes your family and we're doing a great job in the community and our, our community residents tell us we're doing a great part, great job and they're part of what we're doing. I don't know if I answered all of your questions. Uh, was there another part that I missed? If so, shout it out to me and I will get to it. But that was wonderful. Thank you so okay. much. Okay, great. So as Pastor Shona mentioned, Faith in Place has funding for congregations to jumpstart your green team efforts. So if this is something that interests you, you know, make sure you please visit our website at faithinplace.org or fill out the link in the chat that Elena, our tech person today, has provided. We're going to move on to our next poll question. Are you interested in being on a green team? So, Leon, we are finally coming to a close. So I will leave you with this quote from MLK. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. We are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied in a single garment of destiny Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. So again, these are the ways that you can get involved in our advocacy work um, and our other programs that we offer at Faith in Place. Again, this is at no cost to you. All it costs is your time. So if you fill out uh, the interest form that are found in the chats, um, you can attend our August webinars that are coming up and join us for our Green Team Summit, which is a huge event that we have every year. It's our largest event. We bring together all of our green teams and those of, uh, who are interested in starting a green team at their house of worship. Um, and we all get motivated and encouraged to do a lot of the environmental work that I spoke about today. And then also, if you are just interested in starting a green team in general, this is also a great way to get involved and tap into some of our programs. I wanted to end with some of the questions that are usually asked around this particular topic. Number one being, why should those facing other pressing measures, such as food insecurity, violent neighborhoods, lack of employment, or less access to resources, why should they care about the climate crisis? So learning about the climate crisis will only bring out what's already inside every human being. And that is the desire to have access to clean air and clean water. So those are some things to remember um, when those type of questions come up. And what can those who care for the earth do to combat the environmental injustice impacting communities of color? I'll invite you to share your thoughts on this question in the chat. And my answer to this question is a personal one as I'm a black woman in the environmental field. I employ environmentalists to find ways to amplify the voices of those impacted by the climate crisis. And thank you for joining us today. Feel free to reach out, uh, and that's my email there. And I'll make sure and connect you with things that you are interested in or that you learned about today. Please join us for our Green Team Summit, September 13th through the 17th. We will have a, this Green Team Summit virtually, but it's usually uh, at the Field Museum every year. So it's a beautiful space to have it at, but unfortunately, because of COVID-19, we will be doing our Green Team Summit virtually this year. So I encourage you to sign up and register. Again, completely free. All right. Thank you so much. Have a great day.